Today we're going to talk about genomic imprinting, or one campaign in the battle of the sexes. As with many things, we'll start with reproduction. We all know how this works. Female plus male equals offspring. Right? Well, sometimes. In many systems in the living world, organisms can reproduce asexually through a process known as parthenogenesis. This occurs quite naturally in species such as plants, reptiles and amphibians, and many types of birds, including 3% of turkeys. What about in mammals? Notably, parthenogenesis does not occur in mammals. One reason for this is genomic imprinting. This refers to the phenomenon in which genes are differentially expressed based on whether they came from the mother or the father. Both copies are passed down, but only one is functional. So gene division is not always equal? Nope. Well, for the vast majority of genes, it is true. But for a small subset of genes, about 1% of protein coding genes, only one copy from either the mother or the father is functional. What is this madness? Genomic imprinting. This term was coined by a cytogeneticist named Helen Krauss during her work with gnats. In sexual reproduction, an oocyte or egg containing the maternal component of the genome is fertilized by a sperm containing the paternal component of the genome, yielding a fertilized oocyte. The female gives the offspring half of her DNA, and the male gives the offspring half of his DNA. Except for a small group of genes in which only one copy is active. The other copy is silenced. Like I said, they're both passed down, but only one is functional. How does this happen? There are three currently proposed mechanisms of silencing the second copy. The first is the addition of a certain group of carbons and hydrogens, a methyl group, to the DNA to turn it off. Here we have a segment of DNA showing traditional base pairing. With the cytosine guanine base pair, if a methyl group is added to the five position carbon of the cytosine base, this can result in an inability of transcription factors to bind to the promoter, which results in DNA suppression. The second mechanism is changing the protein component of chromatin to alter its function. Here we have an image of histones shown in blue circles and DNA shown in black. The blue squiggly lines are histone tails. When a methyl group is added to the histone tail, this causes condensation of the chromatin, which makes it harder for the DNA to be expressed. If an acetyl group is added to the histone tail, this relaxes the chromatin and makes it easier for the DNA to be expressed. The third mechanism is employing non-coding RNAs to signal whether or not the copy should be turned on. In this image, we have two portions of the genome. The top portion is from the female and the bottom portion is from the male. Genes are shown in the rectangular boxes, with the colored boxes indicating genes that are functional and turned on, and genes in gray boxes indicating genes that are turned off. It's not critical that you remember the individual names of the genes, but take note of the fact that the red box at the front of the line is a long non-coding RNA, which is acting through other elements on this segment of DNA to turn off the genes at the end of the line. This is opposite in the paternal fragment of DNA on the bottom of the screen, where the long non-coding RNA gene is not turned on, and therefore not serving its role as a long non-coding RNA, and allowing for the reciprocal expression of the genes on the end of the segment. Why does this occur? Like I said before, the battle of the sexes. From the female perspective, it is in her best interest to modulate her contribution to individual young so that she may provide for multiple offspring during multiple pregnancies. Therefore, genes that are maternally imprinted have a vested interest in conserving her resources for future young. From the male perspective, it is in his best interest to have his offspring receive maximal nutrients during development and therefore be better equipped to survive and continue to pass on his genes. 
Therefore, genes that are paternally imprinted largely represent those that demand resources from the female. What happens if this goes awry or is manipulated in the lab? With an androgenetic embryo, or one that has two paternal copies of the genome, a pregnancy known as a hydatidiform mole can form. This is a CT image of a woman affected by such a pregnancy in which there is no viable fetus, but rather an overgrowth of placental tissues. With a gynogenetic embryo, or one with two maternal copies, this can result in a structure known as an ovarian teratoma, which has abnormal tissue expression of hair, teeth, and bones. However, in the early 2000s, there was a breakthrough in our understanding of parthenogenesis in mammals. Researchers in China were able to create a mouse using two oocytes and no sperm. They did so by manipulating the genome of one of the oocytes in order to have it express genes that are typically paternally imprinted. This work went far in expanding our understanding of parthenogenesis. Overall, genomic imprinting provides the framework upon which mammals are able to create healthy offspring. Thank you very much.